how we live our life matters so enormously for how we experience the future. Uh, and uh, a lot of time, if you come to the end of your life uh, and all you have done is live for this particular existence, uh, accumulate wealth, doing, you know, living for a social status or, or, you know, having a good education, all of these kind of things. Uh, if you live only for that, I'm not saying we should not live for that, but we live only for that. Uh, if you forget about that, if you forget building up the good qualities inside of you, if you forget about making a beautiful and bright mind inside of you, uh, if you forget all of those things, uh, then when you come to the end of your life, you feel a sense of loss. So you feel that everything you have in the world has to be given up. Everything has to go, and there's nothing you can take with you into the future. It is such a powerful reflection. Yeah, it's such a such a strong, and it shows you the importance of the idea of rebirth in Buddhism. That when you carry on into the future, you want to bring something with you. Just like we want to bring something with us in this life, that is why we build up a certain uh, amount of wealth in this life. That's why we build up a nice place to live. That is why we make sure that we have enough material well-being to be able to enjoy this life so that the future looks bright to us. That's why we educate ourselves when we are young, so we can live all that education for the rest of our lives. But often we forget about the end of this life. We forget about what happens beyond this existence. And that is very short-sighted. And this is where you can see the idea of rebirth is such a paramount importance in the Buddhist teachings. So this means that when we live our lives, we understand how to make good use of it. Good use of it in terms of being generous and kind to other people. Yeah? And as it says here, that generosity that you do in this life, building up those good qualities in this life, that is well salvaged because you have the, the consequences of that is that you will have have happiness in the future leads you on this life. And I would really recommend you try to feel this in this life, try to experience that kind of generosity, yeah, when you actually really want to give, when you really do feel the sense of compassion and sympathy, or you feel inspired by a certain teaching, or you feel something which drives you to uh, uh, do acts of kindness and generosity, uh, then at that time is always the right time to give it. It is the right time. It's a very powerful imprint of the mind. You will remember that act of generosity because you were inspired, because you were driven by compassion and kindness and care and all of these wonderful qualities. You will remember it. Yeah, you won't forget easily. That is the right time to give. And when you think back on those times later on, you will feel some of that emotion of generosity. Some of that kindness will actually come with you. Yeah. And and then you start to understand why generosity is so powerful and more importantly why kindness in general is so powerful. It is powerful for that reason because it uh, allows you to feel good about yourself in an entirely different way. Huh? If all we do is live, you know, live with the material possessions of the world, uh, then life can often feel a bit empty. Huh? It's as if it is missing the news, yeah, that mental energy, the mental um, component uh, which actually makes life really meaningful and purposeful. Uh, so this really matters uh, uh, and uh, generosity for that reason is one of those uh, basic foundational aspects of the Buddhist path. Uh, anyway, so there you are. I just, uh, this is just a fairly random collection of the sutta. I hope you forgive me for being a random monk. I like to be a bit random sometimes. Uh, because randomness is uh, sometimes it's interesting to be a bit random. You yeah, do things in a not that entirely ordered fashion every time, but uh, can bring in things that are a bit different than you. So I hope you, you will forgive. But it's all part and parcel of thinking about life in the right way, having the right view, having the right outlook, the right values, the right... Uh, priorities in our existence. Yeah, It doesn't mean that you have to change your life enormously. It means that the attitude to what you're already doing uh, changes. That is what really matters. Uh, let's go to uh, uh, the next sutta. This is a very uh, famous uh, sutta. It's famous because of the uh, 
uh, the background story uh, comes with this particular sutta. And the uh, uh, background story to the sutta is a very famous, which we call it infamous, yeah, <laughs> because it was a famous, it was an argument in the Sangha. These monks were kind of arguing with each other, brawling and kind of, you know, really calling each other with bad names. And it got so bad that the Buddha eventually had to leave. That's how bad it, bad it was. Yeah, the Buddha said, enough of these monks. They're not listening to me anyway. So why should I hang around? Maybe I should just go. So the Buddha goes off. And then he goes off to the, first of all, he goes off to another couple of monasteries. And he meets some monks who live in great harmony together. And these are, this is the famous monk Anuruddha, who you may know, he was the Buddha's cousin. And two other monks called Kimbila and Nandiya who are living together. And they're almost always considered like the example of how monastics should live together. Yeah, blending together like milk and water, living in perfect harmony together. This was the perfect example of monastics according to the students. And goes and then he goes off to the forest to stay by himself. And this is called the Parileyaka forest. I'm just giving you a little bit of the backstory because some of these backstories are very beautiful and very nice. And it goes to the Parileyaka forest. Uh, that is where you have that very famous um, thing of the Buddha meets the elephant and the elephant after the Buddha. And those stories, they vary a little bit. So some of those stories, they just have an elephant. Some of them also have a monkey. Yeah, the famous story of the monkey who offers what is it, honey? honey or something to the Buddha. And then the monkey gets so excited, yeah, so happy. <laughs> this is a very cute story. Yeah, the monk so happy. Wow, I offered honey to the Buddha. And then bang, he dies. He gets so excited, he dies. He lets go of the branch, falls to the ground, and bang, he gets reborn in heaven. Yeah. This is the story of the famous monkey who gets so excited by giving something to the Buddha that uh, he mindfulness, but still gets reborn in the heaven as, as a consequence. Yeah. It's kind of cute, it's true. I'm not sure if it is a real, uh, just a story or whether it actually happened, but it kind of sounds nice. And remember the monkeys, there's no higher apes. They are very, can be very intelligent beings. So it is not impossible that that may have happened. Yeah, it may not happen to a mosquito. Yeah? A mosquito may not be able to get that kind of happiness. Yeah, unlikely, but a monkey, yeah, maybe an elephant, maybe these are higher beings and they are, quite close to human beings in terms of the evolution of the mind, in terms of the ability to feel emotions and all of these kind of things. So maybe it happened. But anyway, it, so the Buddha stays there and after a while he goes back, yeah, and then he goes to a different place. He doesn't even go back to those monks who were there. And, uh, and then of course, eventually this whole problem is settled. Uh, these particular verses that we are seeing here, these are the verses just as the Buddha is about to leave, leave his monks who are arguing, he's fed up, yeah, just before the Buddha says these verses, the uh, Buddha goes to intervene with the monks, and the monks to the Buddha, they say, yeah, they say, oh, master, you don't worry about this, yeah, we will sort this out, you just live at ease. And this is what they say to the Buddha. Imagine saying something like that to the Buddha. It is very, it is, it is rude when you think about it. The Buddha comes to help you to resolve the problem. You're basically telling the Buddha to stay out of it. Yeah. It's kind of, uh, it is not worse at all. It is, uh, it is actually quite rude, I think. And, and then the Buddha tells these, says these verses because he understands that there's nothing that can be done to turn these monks around. Yeah, now it needs a bit of time. And with that time, then of course, things will turn around themselves. So this is the occasion for these particular verses. And so they're quite powerful. And um, it shows you that, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if you are the Sangha or you are lay people, uh, quarreling and arguing is part of human nature. Yeah, it's very hard. It's almost impossible to avoid this entirely. Uh, and even at the time of the Buddha, when the Buddha was around, these things happened. So um, it is almost to be expected. But of course, we should try to minimize it. And these verses are really about how to minimize argument, minimize quarreling, uh, and to be wise instead about these things. So, 
So this sutta is known as the Uppa Kilesa Sutta, which means like the defilements, yeah, imperfections, it's translated as here. And this is the Buddha speaking just before he's about to depart because he wants to leave these monks behind. And this is what he says. Uh, when many voices shout at once, uh, none considers himself a fool. Though the Sangha is being split, uh, none thinks himself to be at fault. Have forgotten thoughtful speech, uh, they talk obsessed by words alone, uh, uncurbed uh, their mouths, they bawl, they quarrel at will. Uh, none knows what leads him so to act. Uh, he abused me, he struck me, he defeated me, he robbed me. In those who harbor thoughts like these, hatred will never be stopped. He abused me, he struck me, he defeated me, he robbed me. In those who do not harbor thoughts like these, hatred will be stopped. For in this world, hatred is never allayed or stopped by further acts of hate. It is stopped by non-hatred. This is a fixed and ageless law. Those others do not recognize that here we should restrain ourselves. But those wise ones realize this at once and all their enmity. So uh, here you have the uh, Buddha. Uh, looking at the monks, seeing that they're all kind of talking together, all are kind of shouting together, and no one is really kind of uh, taking leader. And everyone, and it's, it's one of these kind of, um, what happens when we, you know, often when we come together as a group, is that we, we forget to think for ourselves. We become part of this group kind of a dynamic. And when everyone else, you know, says things about it, we too say, yeah, it is bad. And we all kind of become like sheep in a sense and following along and without having the ability to stand back and realize what is going on. Yeah, when, uh, when many voices and shout at once, no one considers himself a fool. Doing that when you were alone by yourself, you might realize how stupid you, you are. But because so many other people do it, you lack that ability to stand back and see that what you're doing actually is stupid. What you are doing is causing so much destruction to the point that you are actually splitting the Sangha itself. The Sangha is being split, and yet you don't understand that you are at fault in that kind of situation. And this is so uh, common yeah, in our human realm. We forget the bigger picture here. The bigger picture you can only see when you stand back and you can see the overall effect of what you're doing. Yeah? And the overall effect of what you're doing is very negative and it leads to the destruction of so many things. Uh, and one of the things that it leads to, it leads to the destruction case, which is kind of interesting, is that uh, the lay people understood that we have to take this in our, our own hands. Uh, the monks are arguing, the Buddha has left for good and they say, who are these men? They can just dismiss the Buddha in this way. We have to take this own hands. We have to do something about this. And then later, we're not going to support these monks anymore. We're not going to pay respects to them. We need them food. Yeah. <laughs> And you can imagine what happens if the lay people don't offer food to the monks. Yeah, that is very problematic for the monks. Yeah, because uh, what are you going to do if no one offers you food? You can't cook. Yeah, you can't just climb the mango trees and kind of pluck your own mangoes. You can't pluck your own apples. You can't do anything. You are stuck, basically. You can't go into the field and reap the nearest harvest. You are stuck. Yeah? And that is when you start to come to your senses. And it is very interesting in that sense that uh, this story shows you that sometimes it is actually correct, yeah, or it is acceptable for lay people to intervene in this way when they see that the monastic sangha is getting out of control. Yeah, something is going wrong. They're not living appropriately. They're no longer being a good example of what a monastic should be. In fact, they're being a really bad example. So it's one of the classics found in the Vinaya Pitaka of uh, the lay people actually intervening in a sense in monastic affairs. Uh, so there is a mutual kind of you know, support in this way. Uh, sometimes the monastics may 
intervene a little bit in the lay affairs when they see the lay people going wrong. At other times, the lay people may intervene in this way, in the uh, monastic affairs in this way, yeah? Because uh, the monastics are acting as fools when really they should be the leaders that everyone should rely on them. So they, this is what happens, yeah? You forget the thoughtful speech and you get obsessed by words, yeah? arguing back and forth and you're arguing and no one really understands what you are led by. Yeah, what leads you on becomes obscured because of this. You don't understand that you are led by views, opinions. You are led by your defilements. You are led by the group dynamic. You're not led by wisdom anymore. You're not standing back, uh, asking yourself, am I doing the right thing? You're not taking an individual stand for what is right. You're driven by the group, driven by the people around you. So you become blind, yeah, and this is, of course, a problem. And this is so important in Buddhism, to be able to think for ourselves, to be able to stand, you know, to take a stand right in this world. And uh, this is what the Buddha did. We sometimes we forget that, that the Buddha himself, uh, he was a revolutionary. The Buddha uh, rejected all the uh, religions of the time. Uh, he re rejected the Brahmanical religion. And that is one of the reasons why we respect the Buddha so highly, because he was so independent. Uh, he was able to find the truth without having anyone else to support him. Uh, that is what is so magnificent about the Buddha. Yeah, this is what it makes him such a genius. The fact that he was able to stand back and look at everyone kind of neutrality with compassion, with care, with metta, of course, but also with the idea of discerning wisdom and then make the breakthrough all of his own. That is what is so superb about the Buddha. That is why he is really worthy of such incredible respect, that individuality, that independence from everyone else. There's something very powerful about that. And we need every one of us to try to emulate that a little bit. Yeah, stand back and be able to do the right thing here. Yeah. I have these beautiful verses that I'm sure you have heard before, which are very common here, very commonly in the Buddhist world. Uh, and the verses about, uh, you know, you think, oh, they abused me, they hit me, they defeated me, they robbed me. Yeah, all of this complaining when other people do the wrong thing by us, uh, which happens so often in the world. Yeah, they are doing bad things against me, me, me. It's about me. How can they dare that do think bad things against me? That is really bad, yeah? And when you think like that, that other people are doing bad things against you, against me, then happens and become hateful. You become angry. Why? Because you take the things happening in the world personally. It is personal. You think that someone else is doing bad things against you. They have it in for you. Yeah. Then you take it really badly and you become angry. If you hear about someone doing something bad against someone else, how do you feel? You don't feel very much. Yeah. You may not like it. You may see that it is wrong, but you don't have hatred and anger because it is towards someone else. If it is towards you, however, that is where anger usually arises. There's a very powerful psychological insight here that a lot of the ill will that we have, a lot of the anger that we have in the world comes because we take things personally. Other pe people are doing it against me, not others, but me. That is the problem. And so the solution is very simple. The solution is, if you, if you don't think he abused me, he struck me, he defeated me, he robbed me, in those who do not have thoughts like this, uh, hatred will stop. Hatred will readily be a hate. If you don't think that others are doing it against you, uh, then it comes to an end. So how can you do that? Uh, if someone really is shouting at you, uh, if someone is a high, a difficult boss, if you have maybe uh, some family members who are very respectful or kind towards you, uh, how can you think in this way? Because it doesn't sound, how can you possibly think in this way when it really feels like it is against you? What is the way of dealing with this? And this is where the idea of right view comes in, the idea of thinking about the world in the right way. Uh, this is where that comes in, uh, because it 
initially it may sound impossible. Of course they are doing it against me, so how can I not have ill will? But that is exactly the point. They are not doing it against you. The reason why other people rob you or the reason why they beat you or the reason why they use harsh speech is not because of you, it's because of them. Yeah, it is because of their own defilements, it's because of their own ill will. And if they do it against you, you can be absolutely sure they will also do it against others. It is just that you happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Maybe you are the kind of victim that they like, but if there was a person like you in the same spot, they would do it exactly the same thing against the other person as well. It is not about you, it is about the other person. They are the one that have the problem. So in this way, by reminding yourself that what is going on here is that the other person is conditioned in a certain way, have a certain habits that they cannot step out of. This is part of the personality. This is how they are. They cannot be any other way here because this is how they are. And you realize it is not you who have the problem. They are the ones that have the problem because they are trapped in that personality. They are trapped in those habits. And this is part of the non-self. Yeah, the idea that we are not, we are only a tiny little bit responsible for who we are. If I ask any one of you, if I ask myself to step out of my personality, can you step out of your personality? It's impossible, right? Because this is what you are. So you are trapped in that personality. You are trapped in those habits. You are trapped with who you are. So you have to learn to gradually develop out of that thing, out of this thing who you are. Diminish those, things, build up the good qualities of compassion and kindness. And gradually we can do that by allowing ourselves to be influenced by the teachings, be influenced by these marvelous things, by thinking like we are thinking now. And gradually you can develop in this way. But over the short run, your habits are going to be very powerful. And for most people in the world who do not practice a spiritual life, the habits are always going to be in charge. The personality stable is going to be roughly the same. It's not going to change. So when you see someone who is acting badly towards you, you should have compassion for that person. That is the ideal way of thinking here. Because you should realize this person doesn't know what they're doing. This person is trapped in certain habits. They are trapped in a certain way of being, in a certain personality. And because of that, there's nothing they can do. And it's such a powerful way of thinking. Yeah, this is really, really, really powerful. You just have to get used to this idea of thinking about the world world and it is far more realistic than the way we normally think about things because this is actually how it is and the buddha uses these ideas the suttas to remind us how we can have compassion towards others they are sick they are deluded they are walking in the dark they are hurting others and when they hurt others they are like own enemies like i mentioned the other day here they are like their own enemies because in the long run the person they really hurt is themselves. So when, next time someone is doing something wrong, have compassion for them. They don't know what's going on. Yeah? Turn the table around. Instead of being angry, instead of thinking about yourself, about me, it's about me, 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 my little world, and you're confined within your own little space. Yeah? The tiny me, the more you think about yourself, the smaller our world is, the less expansive our mind is, the more we are trapped into this with our little greeds and little ill wills but the moment you stop thinking about yourself it is as if your mind starts to expand it expands out and it embraces the world and embraces people around you you become more compassionate you have more kindness your heart grows out to people in the world and what a wonderful thing that is and when that happens it's like you are liberated to some extent from this time Finally, me is always there, enclosed in this space yeah, of me, this small little world, feeling the boundaries around it. Don't come too close to me. Don't look at my things. Don't steal anything from me. No, instead, you bring people in and you bring the world in. And this, by doing things in this way, you are reducing so many of the problems in your own life, so much of the anxiety of existence, so much of the greed, so much of the fear, so much of the ill will that you have towards other people. So there's something 
very powerful in these very simple verses. Uh, if you draw out the meaning in the right way, there's something very beautiful going on here. Uh, and by doing this, uh, you are actually undermining some of the defilements in the human mind that are the most, the worst defilements, the defilements of hatred, of ill will, of anger, and these kind of things. And these are some of the worst things because they lead to so much happiness in the world. And they really can destroy our own looks if we don't deal with them in the right way. And you will be surprised if you think like this in a logical way, if you take this to heart and you do this on a regular basis and you learn to reflect on the world in the right way, you will be very surprised how over time, over the weeks, months, your yeah, your level of anger, I know that many of you are not angry people at all. I've known many of you for a long time. I know you are very good people, but uh, still, yeah, still, most people still have some degree of anger. And maybe some of you have more than others. It's always a people vary, depending on who they are. But you will notice that these levels go down. They start dropping. And you start to be much more difficult for you to get angry with anyone because you really start to have compassion for the world. So this is very powerful. This is about right view again, how we use right view to enable a reduction in our defilements yeah, for the benefit of ourselves and everyone else. This time. And then comes the last of these verses, which also is so beautiful and powerful. It says that for in this world, hatred is never stopped by more hatred. It is stopped by non-hatred. This is an ageless law. Yeah, hatred, you cannot stop hatred by more hatred. If someone is angry with you, getting angry back is not going to work. If someone wants to go to war with you, then fighting back with anger and ill will is probably not going to work. Hatred gets hatred. If you are angry, then usually other people get angry with you. But if you are able to react in a calm way, in a way which maybe has compassion for the other person, because you understand that deep inside they are hurting. They are hurting if they're acting in the wrong way. They are hurting if they are people in the wrong way. There's something inside of them which isn't right. They don't have enough metta. They don't have enough loving kindness. They don't have enough compassion or understanding for the world. They have wrong view, whatever it is. Then when you come with compassion and kindness, often the situation will be diffused because of that. Sometimes it may not be diffused, and that's okay. Still, you have act with kindness, uh, but other, other times it will be uh, diffused and kind of lead to something positive. Uh. So meeting hate with hate uh, is never going to work. Uh. Meeting hate with a sense of peace, uh, a sense of equanimity, even compassion, that is the right way of doing things. Uh. And if you uh, look at how the Buddha would occasionally meet people who were angry with him and the suttas. Uh, you can see how powerful is. Uh, yeah, the Buddha just meets them with equanimity. Uh, and then he may speak a verse to them and saying, I don't accept your hatred. Uh, yeah, your hatred just falls back on you. Uh, and uh, then uh, something happens in that person. Uh, and very often they end up being turned on uh, and then becoming disciples of the Buddha and then practicing and then having good results in the practice. Uh, yeah, it's so, it's so beautiful when we see that. Uh, yeah, that people turn around and they come around and they become, uh, they really change entirely when you meet them with this kind of person. Uh, it's so, uh, it's very, very, very powerful. Kindness is a very powerful thing in this world. Uh, because people are not really used to be, being met with kindness uh, in these kind of situations. So, so uh, this is a fixed ageless law. Yeah, this has got nothing to do with Buddhism. This is just the way it are, that hatred uh, never stops with more hatred. Uh. And those others who do not recognize that here we should restrain ourselves, uh, but those wise ones who realize this at once end all their enmity. Yeah. So by holding back, yeah, by restraining yourself, or even better, by being wise to the situation yeah, and not uh, replying ill will with, uh, with non-ill will, yeah, um, you 
uh, you diffuse the whole situation uh, and there's no enmity. The enmity disappears. Uh, and the enmity very often will be the enmity in your own heart. Yeah, this will be the most important thing. Uh, and at the very least, end that enmity. You can be at peace. What happens to the other person is hard to say. Uh, sometimes they also become peaceful, but not always. Uh. Okay, so that is the uh, famous... Uh, Upa Kilesa Sutta, Imperfections. And if you wish to read it, you will notice that I have given the reference there in the top corner. It says MN128, and you may wonder what on earth that means. Many of you will know what it means, but if you don't know what it means, it, uh, ah, there you are. Thank you so much. I don't know who is doing this, but it's very kind of you to bring these things up. And uh, if you don't know what it means, it MN stands for Madhanikaya, the middle length sayings of the Buddha. Yeah. This is the uh, very famous books of Buddhist scriptures. Uh, and one to eight is the number of the discourse, the number of that particular scripture, if you like. Yeah? And, and you can, if you don't have these things uh, in your house or accessible, these things can be found online. And there is a very good website now called Sutta Central, suttacentral.net, and all of these suttas are available. lines long and this is how it goes yeah uh, virtue is good until old age faith is good when established wisdom is the precious gem of humans merit is hard for thieves to steal yeah so that is that little sutta so very, very short, four little lines, but also very meaningful. There it is, it just come up on the screen. I'll read it again. Virtue is good until old age. Faith is good when established. Wisdom is the precious gem of humans. Merit is hard for thieves to steal. So uh, uh, very simple, but it kind of brings out some of the main ideas of uh, uh, the Buddhist path, yeah? Uh, virtue is good. Virtue here is morality, and it's good, good until they. Uh, and uh, 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 what is the uh, Pali? Sila is the is the word here, obviously for morality, as you would expect. So sila is good until old age. Uh, and uh, what what does that mean exactly? And I would try, as always, to try to maybe bring out the meaning a little bit, even though it may be obvious in once and please remember that when you read the suttas then you are allowed you know to be a bit uh, to think about what it means and make it meaningful for yourself uh, so all i do is give you some suggestions how to think about this uh, because i have thought about the suttas and i have practiced them for so long uh, i've been a monk now for what is it 25 years it's just it doesn't seem that long but it doesn't sound like when, when i say it out 25 years uh, it means that I have a lot of experience yeah, and I have translated most of these suttas and I have done all kinds of things. Uh, so for that reason, I, you know, I have a, a little bit of advantage over most of you, yeah? Just a tiny bit of advantage. So that's why I like to try to bring out the meaning because it gives me, uh, it's, it's nice for me, it's joyful for me to be able to talk about these things that are so beautiful here. So virtue is good until old age and, and I think, this can be understood in a couple of different ways. Yeah, the first way is to understand that uh, even if you are older, yeah, sometimes you may not be able to practice meditation so much. Actually, you can as when you're old as well, because sometimes you can just take a more easy posture, yeah, like lying down or something. But things get more difficult uh, when you get old. But you can always be virtuous. Uh, you can always think in the right way. You can always. Uh, be kind and caring to the people around you. Huh? 
And sometimes, as you can see, old people, they are actually very good at that. They often become a bit wiser you know, with old age. And sometimes they do become very caring and kind when they get older. People kind of mellow a little bit as they age. So virtue is always good. You always bring it, you can always practice this, even when you are very old. You can maybe not become a monk or a nun so easily anymore. You cannot live in the forest kuti, but you certainly can practice virtue. Huh? But the other thing here, which I think is the main is, is that uh, uh, if you have lived well, if you have lived a virtuous life throughout your life, uh, if you have been kind to others, uh, if you have been careful how you think about other people, thinking with kindness, thinking with care, thinking with compassion and all kinds of things, uh, then uh, what that means is that you have this reservoir, you have this built up, all of these good qualities inside of you. Yeah, you have built up something that makes old age, aging, it makes it more easy to deal with. Uh, if you come to the end of your life uh, and you have a mind that is in a good place, that is positive, that is uh, kind, that is caring, that is bright in a certain way, uh, then you are able to deal with the difficulties, the indignities and the hardship of old age much more easily. Uh, and you can go through that process with a sense of peace rather than being uh, distraught by them or distraught by, you know, having to have other people to look after all the time and all of that. Uh, and then it is marvelous. And then even if you have to, you know, live by yourself when you're old, then maybe you enjoy that time by yourself, yeah, because you are a happy person. Maybe you enjoy just being by yourself and meditating and reading. Even if you are alone, you are not lonely. In fact, you enjoy that fact of being in solitude by yourself. So there's so many benefits of having lived well when you are so this is uh, this, yeah, so you are getting ready, if you like, uh, for that uh, difficulties of old age, if you live it well. And then it says that um, uh, faith is good when established. Well, uh, faith here, the word is different kind of meanings, and depending a little bit on how we read it, it actually has different connotations to us. Uh, and it's important to kind of understand these different connotations a little bit. Uh, but first of all, what does it mean to be established faith? Uh, and one of the things, one of the main thing that it means is you become a stream entry. Yeah, one of the people who have understood the Dharma confidence is established. And the reason why confidence is established is because you have seen out that is why it is established. You have no choice anymore, but confident. And the idea of the meaning of Sadha in Buddhism, yeah, we often think of faith coming from a Christian background or maybe an Islamic background or some of these other religions, and faith is like this um, thing here. Whereas in Buddhism, faith is directly connected with directly connected with insight, and that is why come to understand what Sadha is about. You have full confidence because you know what is going on. So, Sadha, yeah, when you become a stream enter, a bit of Of course, our inclination to the Dhamma, our understanding of the, uh, the Buddha and his teachings are something very, very exceptional in the world, something really remarkable that has this incredible promise of a you know, final release from all suffering and the highest kind of happiness. There's something really extraordinary about that. Uh, and, uh, uh, but what we start to realize that our faith as Buddhism is not the shallow kind of faith where you just believe, you just believe that these teachings are right, but it is the kind of faith where you understand these teachings, you have reflected on them, and you have come to actually match with how life really works, they match with the psychology of human beings, they are talking about the human condition in a very profound way, that is what faith means. understanding, established in knowing what the suttas are about. If faith is more superficial, if it is the kind of faith that some people have, uh, yeah, I, be I believe in Buddhism, and you have never, you know, you have this, oh, yeah, the Buddha, oh, he's wonderful, and you bow down to the Buddha, but you don't really know what it is about. You come up easy prey for being converted to other religions, yeah? If someone says, oh, but I have a better religion, yeah, God, that's really handy, yeah, it's so much easier. I, I don't have to do all of this practice pray to God regularly, and God will kind of help me out, and if I need something, God will deliver it. Yeah, that's a theistic religion instead. It could become easy prey to these kind of ideas because you haven't really thought about life properly here. So, but I think to me, it uh, doesn't just live life without you know, any, uh, consideration for what is going on. It will often, not always, but we often tend towards Buddhism because the Buddhist teachings are really extraordinary in the sense that this 
So I would, I to me, Buddhism is always the thinking person's religion, the realistic person's religion. And then when you uh, think about it in that way, faith becomes a sense of way. It becomes a sense of confidence, but it also brings with it the idea of faith, the idea that uh, you know the traditional way of thinking that faith is the idea of you have strong faith it means that you think wow this is just so marvelous i have the greatest spiritual master in the history of the world as my teacher wow this is just so easy happiness in the human condition can eliminate all suffering it is a realistic kind of teaching i'm so fortunate this is so amazing that i'm this thousand years here was a teacher who taught these teachings two and a half thousand years ago thinking about you know there will be people in the future also being inspired by this teacher what an amazing that is the buddha is that way that you have the buddha as your teacher and his incredible powerful teachings as the guide for your life it is just absolutely amazing it's also possible to feel a sense of joy it's almost like you want to cry because it is so powerful yeah, at some point, he just bows down to the Buddha and he will have tears of joy come to something so powerful, so, so beautiful, so um, exceptional. And that is the idea of faith. That is the other side of faith, the emotional aspect. Engaged in deep confidence, you know what is going on. And then emotional aspect coming out of understanding what you have, what beautiful gem, what a marvelous gift. And this is what we mean when we talk about Buddha Nusati, and Dhamma Nusati. It should not be something dry. It should not just be, oh, it is so Buddha. It's not that kind of thing. I think where you are really engaged with what is going on, you understand what is behind these words. You understand the power of these things. That emotional, felt experience. Then they will take you on the deep stages of meditation. They will help you with your Anapanasati practice. I heard Angie before, she was mentioning about, you know, the original state, Angie, because I didn't hear you, but I assume we're talking about precisely Anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, because that obviously is, the, uh, is what that original meditation is about. Uh, so, uh, and that, this contemplation to empower it. it uh, and then it becomes really beautiful. So it is worthwhile trying to understand what it is that we have, this incredible gem, this gem in the world, over this desert of samsara, which otherwise is empty and so barren. People without faith, it is said, it is like crossing a desert without provisions. You have nothing to nourish, nothing powerful. There's no, none of this uh, uh, thing that gives you hope and meaning and purpose. Yeah? This gives you meaning and purpose in life. You know that there's something really important, a lack of meaning very often, a lack of purpose. The lack of bigger truth, what life really is about. So this is very nice. This is just so uplifting. Yeah. So try, if you can, to think about these things in the right way. So this good gem of humans. Yeah. Even more precious, but because it is part of the idea of faith and faith and wisdom are very very closely connected in Buddhism. So all the things I said before, deeper wisdom goes to understanding the human condition, understand what is happiness in the world, what leads away from suffering. Yeah, this is what wisdom really is about. Uh, understanding in a deep way so useful. Uh, yeah, because uh, it gives you access <coughs> to that very thing that all humans are looking for meaning and purpose. We are looking for some kind of solution to our lives. Uh, and this is what wisdom runs. Uh, this is what we get from the Buddha. This is the gem that we have. Gradually and slowly you emerge out of the swamp of existence. Uh, yeah, it's like you are getting out of the quicksand, yeah? being pulled out of the quicksand by the Buddha, and eventually kind of uh, sky soaring up above the human condition, looking down and understand what is going on. And the more you soar up, uh, soaring up is like the samadhi, where you kind of get away from the ordinary and surreal existence of the world, looking down, understanding the landscape for the first time in your life. Uh, then wisdom starts to accumulate. Uh, then you can make an outlook of the world. Uh, and, uh, but in the meantime, we have to rely a little bit on the wisdom of the Buddha. This is the right view that we're talking about now. This is how humans merit is hard for thieves to steal. Yeah, thieves can steal everything in your life. At the very the worst thief of all the thieves, you know, it's death. Because death steals everything from you. Everything that you have in your life, all your relationships, all the people in your life, everything you own, all the things even your own body has to go. So much has to go. Death is the final thief. And in the meantime, a lot of things are stolen before that by real thieves of the world. But there are certain things that cannot be stolen of your heart. So sure, that you build up that goodness in this life, that kusala kamma, the good actions that we pass away. So 
yeah, everything else gets stolen except for the goodness, the merit that we have now. So anyway, so these are the, uh, you know, I personally find them very quite inspiring and quite enriching. So I hope you are able to see things in the same way that I do. You may not, you may not be, you know, feel like these things. That's okay. So it works for you now. I'm just here to see what I see if I can add something here. So I'm going to look at one more sutta, Majjhima Nikaya. This is number 129. And this sutta is called The Fools and the Wise People. Fools and Wise People. So um, uh, that's kind of interesting. You, every one of you would like to be wise, I assume. If you don't want to be wise, then this is your chance to turn off your sound so you don't hear what's happening now. But I'm assuming really good, yeah? Wisdom is so useful. As I said just now, wisdom is all about, uh, you know, the uh, being able to live happily and well. So of course, people want, would want to be wiser. Uh, but uh, sometimes you wonder if people would like to be fools because they turn away from the wise message. Anyway, this um, sutta makes a distinction between the foolish people wise. And uh, uh, so I'm going to read out what happens if you are wiser, yeah? And this is wise in a kind of, in every one of us. So we can all be wise in this particular way, yeah? And this is what, how this sutta reads, this is from Bhante Sujato's translation, this one here. The characteristics, signs and manifestations of a wise person. What three here? A wise person thinks well, speaks well, and acts well. If a wise person didn't think well, we know that it was a wise person. How could we know that? It is precisely because the wise person thinks well, speaks well, and acts well, that we can know. That. So this is the first one, very I think a very important point right there, and I don't know if you can see why that is people in our world who are worthy of respect and worthy of reverence and worthy of being listened to, they are the people who are kind, yeah? Not only kind in the way they act, but kind throughout. Think these are the people who are worthy of respect in this world. They are the wise people. If someone is a bit of a scallywag, a bit of a character, who you know, does all kind of called spiritual people who are scallywags in the world, yeah, who are perhaps abusing their disciples a little bit or spending money on no business, common. And we should know on their conduct that they are not wise people. And the mind always have to take wise, yeah, in a deep sense, you are an arahant or whatever, and acting is good, you act badly, yeah, all of that kind of falls through her. So that is a already a very important point to remember. Wise people, they act as if they are wise. And if you see someone who is, don't judge too quickly, but at least initially be skeptical unless there are, uh, you know, some other reason to, to, to think that uh, it is okay or whatever. So this is the uh, end. We want to talk about the, um, the wise person. What, what are the benefits of being wise? And he says that and a wise person experiences three life. Suppose a wise person is sitting in a council hall, sitting on a street, sitting at crossroads, proper and fitting things. And suppose that the wise person is someone who is refraining from killing living beings, refraining from stealing, uh, refraining from committing, refraining from alcoholic drinks that cause events. Yeah, then that wise person thinks if people are discussing what is proper and fitting, and those things are found in me. The first kind of pleasure and that's what a wise person experiences in the present life. Yeah, so this means that you know that uh, you are with wise people, uh, when you hang around the Arahants, please hang around Arahants, and that they are a little bit hard to find, but if you do find an Arahant, please hang out with those Arahants. And uh, there are some people in the world who come, I would say, very close, yeah, when you see them, you think, wow, this person, hang out with those people. And when you hang out with those people, what happens is that you will notice the way they speak. They speak in such a way that you will be happy if you are living according to precepts, if you are living with kindness, you will feel that they are praising you because you know that those are already found in you, you will have a warm and good happiness. Yeah, the wise people in the world would praise you. The wise people in the world would know that you're doing the good thing here. Yeah? And if there are some scallywags in the world who don't praise you, who cares what the scallywags in the world think? Yeah, it's kind of irrelevant that they would like you to do bad things. Who cares what the, what the scallywags are saying? Yeah? It's kind of completely irrelevant. So that is the first kind of happiness, yeah? Uh, uh, and then there's the second type. Furthermore, the wise person, see, or the legal system, yeah? They have a 
arrested a bad criminal and subjected them to various kinds of punishments. So I'm, I'm not going to read done in ancient times, and it's kind of I don't think it's quite kind of irrelevant. And so I, I should have I should have kind of left that out, but for some reason I left it in there. So don't worry too much about that. But various companies going to Changi Jail. Have you have any one of you been to Changi? I, I've been to Changi a few times. Yeah, not because I was an inmate, I wasn't locked up in Changi, but because I I went there poor on a few occasions. And wow, it's pretty pretty scary. Yeah, in Changi prison, it's pretty pretty pretty. Ooh, it's kind of steel and. And you know, well, it doesn't, it's not, not a very friendly place to be. I wouldn't recommend it if you uh, can avoid it. I would recommend you to avoid hanging out in Changi. I don't know the equivalent prison is in uh, KL in, for, the, for the BGF, so I can't really tell, but, but I have a slightly unnerving experience to be locked into these doors and not knowing for sure whether you're going to be locked out again. Yeah, once you're in there, you have to have you know, thought that goes through your head <laughs> when you go into Changi prison. Oh, help. Please promise that you will, you know, let me out again afterwards. Uh, into prison, yeah. Sometimes we all make mistakes. Sometimes we are tempted to do the wrong thing, uh, and the consequences of that is that we may actually end up in prison, uh, or we may end up even worse, yeah. In, in with a uh, sometimes countries have death penalty, and you may end up with a death penalty for something, yeah. And then see. If you are independent, you don't allow yourself to be swayed by other people. It's kind of a, a problem uh, that can happen to people. Uh. Anyway, so let's go look go to the last one, last on actually the second last benefit. And this next benefit is far more interesting. It has to do with the very purpose of sila, why we really should have virtue, why it matters so enormously. So furthermore, when the on the ground, uh, they passed good actions, uh, good conduct of body, speech, and mind, they settle down upon them, rest down upon them, like the shadow of a great mountain peak in the evening as it settles down, rests down, and lays down upon the earth. In the same way, when astute or wipers, they pass these, the good conduct by the speech and mind settles down upon them, rests down upon them, and lays down upon them. Isn't that a beautiful little simile? Once you uh, live a good life, you do the right thing, and the more powerful that kindness is, uh, the more powerful your ability to treat other people is, uh, the more ability you have to do this moment after more. When you finally come back to rest, uh, when you are able to let go a little bit of the world, uh, when you go on a repeat, uh, you come here to do good about yourself. Uh, there's a warm feeling in your heart uh, because you know that you are living well. Uh, yeah, It is kind, it's filled up by a good Good feeling yourself because you know that you are a person. Huh? Isn't that beautiful? You cannot escape those directions. Huh? You cannot escape being happy about your self-esteem. Yeah, you are. You have this good, general good feeling about yourself. Huh? And what a wonderful thing that is huh? to have this thing. This have self-esteem problems or may not feel good about that. This is the way to do that. Huh? And of course, very closely related to the idea of sila nusati, the recollection of your sila, or the recollection of chaga, recollection of your jasa. Sometimes people, when they try to do the sila nusati, uh, recollect their kindness or whatever, they try very hard with their mind and they kind of force their mind to remember things in the past. Simple, uh, something very easy that comes almost naturally. Uh, yeah? It comes naturally because it... Uh, uh, it's just something you so in, you cannot avoid feeling good about yourself. And then when you sit down, you close your eyes, you almost automatically feel happy about your life. This is the ideal way of doing Sila Nusati. You don't have to try too hard uh, to kind of to uh, nudge the mind a little bit, uh, yeah, just to give a little bit of reminder of where to look and what to think about. Uh, and then it will help you to remind yourself of your, uh, you are such a good person that uh, these things just happen. Uh, and perhaps some of you may wonder, how does this work? You know, I've been keeping like this for so long. And the answer is that one of the difficulties of the world is that we have to really be brutally honest with ourselves on our own shortcomings. Uh, you really have to know, am I thinking pure enough, not just in terms of the five precepts, but in terms of sama vajra, right speech, yeah, which includes... Uh, so if you want to make full progress on this path, we really have to be very honest with ourselves to understand our weaknesses uh, so as to enable us to redirect, to think about the world. Brutal honesty, which can be painful, yeah, because sometimes we don't want to know about our negative answer. But if you are really committed to the spiritual life, this is the only way. You need sometimes to be able to confront that um, negative aspects of our personality to be demanding, yeah? But precisely because it is demanding, it also has incredibly powerful fruits uh, if we live it in the right way here. And uh, then, uh, so he, they rest upon him. They 
lay out a plan. Yeah, and then uh, you think, the wise person thinks, well, I haven't done what is corrupt. I have done good and skillful deeds that keep me safe. When I pass away, I'll go to the place where people who have done such things go. So they don't sorrow and pine. This is the third kind of pleasure and happiness that the wise person experiences in present life. Then we have the last kind of happiness. And this is the one that has to do with the future life, not that they are reborn in a good place, in the heavenly realm. And if there is anything of which it might be rightly said, desirable, utterly agreeable, it is of heaven that this should be said. So much so that it is not easy to give a simile for how pleasurable heaven. Wow, that sounds pretty, pretty good. Yeah, so going to heaven there is even much higher happinesses than that. Even heavenly pleasures are fairly old, even though they are praised here to the sky. Still, there is a high, even high, so happy to go to heaven. It's hard to really think that there's even more happinesses beyond. But that is what the Buddha says. Beyond the heavenly realm, beyond the limits of the heavenly realm, there's even more to be had for the path properly. But at the very least, yeah, if you don't attain the Bar Nation Prize, for those who don't go all the way, so if you are happy with the consolation prize, at least you might go to heaven instead. And even that is a... So, oh, there you are. That is the uh, uh, suttas for today. So, um, uh, let us there, because we need to get... Now, now we have done the theory, now we can see how it works out, in whether we're able to apply this properly by doing some meditation together. So... Ajahn Brahmali, could we have a five minute toilet break, please? Of course, you have six minutes. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> Starling, are you there? Uh, yes, attendant. Uh, when can we hang out with Ajahn Brahmali? Can you hang out with Ajahn Brahmali? Ajahn Brahmali is giving a live streaming talk on January the 3rd um, at 3 p.m. at Singapore. Uh, do go in and uh, 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 to BF uh, Facebook. He will be uh, streamed live uh, on the January 3rd uh, Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. So how's your schedule next schedule year? It's quite heavy already. Quite a lot of things happening here, as usual. So yeah, you'll be but, taking uh, Ajahn Brahm's yeah. place, uh, is that? No, it's not. It's, 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 not, it's just <laughs> that, you know, I mean, even now there's very big demand for retreats. Everyone knows. So we're doing a lot of retreats and we have a, and I, I will also, you can travel now. So I probably go going to Melbourne and Sydney and these kind of things. Uh, so it is surprisingly how much, you know, the, the hunger for the Dhamma. I think maybe now it is even more than before because, uh, People have some consolation when you know, things are so difficult. So the, the hunger for the Dhamma is actually very, very large. And the Dhamma has so much to provide yeah, in terms of support when it comes. A wonderful thing to be able to share this teaching with everyone. Huh? So, yeah. Thank you, Ajahn. Yeah. Nice to hear from you, Bobby. <laughs> I'm Terence, Ajahn. Bobby oh, Terence, is, is it? Okay, channel. it's not Bobby. Okay. Yeah. I, thought, I thought it was Bobby. I, somehow I, Bobby, okay. do you want to okay. show okay. yourself? <laughs> Where are you? Uh -huh. Terence. Your face not big enough, parents. Oh, Bobby is in. I don't know whether he's behind the camera. Okay, never mind. It's okay. I can, I can speak to Bobby at some point. You are behind your words.
Okay, everyone, so let's uh, get back to, as I say, see if we can apply these teachings, at least in this particular way. So, um, as always, just uh, make sure you sit down, it can be about 40 minutes long, so it's nice if you are able to hold that posture for 40 minutes, it's nice. If you can't, it's always okay to move as well for yourself. Uh, and to remind you once again that the uh, idea behind meditation is really not to do anything at all, rest in a way, and then make sure that your mind is kind of uh, pre-directed, if you like, using right view, directed towards peace, directed towards uh, uh, the stillness inside and is in the right, in the wrong place. Uh, and this is why right view, again, matters so much, uh, because it guides the mind, uh, allow mind to look in the right place uh, and not have to do anything at all about it. Uh, not things to flow. Uh, and remember again, the idea of, uh, not doing anything here. I will give you another example. And one way of thinking about this is to think about uh, the idea of being on your deathbed. Uh, imagine that you are on your deathbed. What's very often is that there is nothing more to be done. Uh, you are finished with this life. Uh, you are coming to the very end. Uh, and you're done. Uh, it means the mind tends to quiet on your deathbed. Uh, and because we never know when life is going to come to an end, uh, we might as well be ready now. Uh, this is the power of the death contemplation, uh, about the death contemplation. Uh, but for now, just imagine that you are on the uh, And there is something else about the deathbed that is so beautiful. Uh, try to become peaceful. Uh, you don't try to do anything in particular. But because the mind knows that it is coming to the end, life is coming to an end, uh, it is towards peace. Uh, there's nothing to be done. Uh, there's nothing to be sorted out. Peace is almost natural for that reason. And for this, doing meditation practice is almost the same thing. So try to use this kind of method, the bringing up the perception of being on your deathbed and see if that helps you to
And uh, again, uh, see if you are able to use uh, the idea of dying to support meditation. Uh, dying, we're doing the same thing. We are giving up and renouncing things. Uh, and that is why they can be used in conjunction. Uh, so if you are on your deathbed again, uh, there's nothing to allow the mind to flow. Uh, there's no need to control anything anymore. Uh, so make sure you relax in the same way as if you are on your deathbed. Uh, but also because there is no future anymore, uh, there's nothing that needs to be done. Uh, there's nothing that needs to be sorted out. Uh, because of that, you also let go of this world uh, and you allow to move towards peace uh, in a insight. Uh, it is based on the understanding that there is nothing to be done. Uh, in the same way, there is nothing to be done for you now. Uh, so bring up that idea uh, in the right way. Uh, And uh, as you are lying on your deathbed in this way uh, and just relaxing, just enjoying the idea of letting go, uh, as the breath will come into view. Uh, but on your deathbed, you are not trying desperately to hold on to the breath uh, as it will. Uh, and if the breath disappears for a while, uh, you don't worry about it. Uh, you just wait until the breath comes back again. No force, uh, no willpower is being used. Uh, this is the ideal way of doing the breath meditation. And then on your death better, the easy way the force without real power.
and uh, as you are lying there and nothing to look forward to, uh, and so you tend to be peaceful. Uh, and so remember how you have lived your life. Uh, remember that you have lived your life well, uh, passionate to the best of your ability. Uh, wow, what a wonderful thing that is. Uh, what a marveling is to live such a life uh, and to be a contribution to the world, a uh, contribution to my family and myself uh, in having lived breath contemplation. Uh, and as you bring these things together at the same time, then uh, the mind is gradually bringing up good qualities. Uh, And uh, after a while, uh, there's almost nothing. You and the breath uh, hanging out together. Uh, you and this beautiful friend, the breath, uh, is always there to support you. Uh, this joyful companionship uh, moving forward uh, in meditation.
Okay, so coming close again to the end of the meditation, again, a few minutes, a minute or two, just to uh, review your progress or lack of progress. Uh, and try to understand, if you can, how the process is when it works in the right way, uh, and how it really is a matter of just waiting. Uh, and try to understand the idea of how perceptions develop in your meditation here. Uh. Okay, everyone, uh, nice to be with you again. So, uh, thank you and, uh, uh, take care. Okay, let us pay respects to Ajahn before he leaves. Thank you, Ajahn. See you tomorrow. You are linked here. Yeah.